As we're talking about how to grow and work with big data, one of the things we need to do is be able to look at it and query it. And anybody who's played with their iTunes playlist, as everybody in the room, iTunes playlist, okay, you know about metadata, which is you have a song. The song has, it's, you don't just care about the music. If you only care about the music, you wouldn't have iTunes and the interface. But you do care about more. You care about the album cover. You care about the lyrics. You care about who, what artist composed it. You care about what performed it, what, what artist wrote it. You care about what year it was. You care about the bit rate. You care about a ton of things, what, you know, uh, what location it was performed in. All these things are part of the metadata. The actual data is just the music, just the file itself of the music. The metadata lets you organize it in clever ways and say, I, today I feel like hearing some disco. So I use my metadata to filter it, my whole collection, to only the disco music, and bam, it's on my, iP my iPod. Okay? So metadata is useful for searching and filtering and getting to what you want. So metadata is really useful. But that's just an example with music. There's metadata with almost every data file. It's data about the data. The data itself is you know, the, the temperature readings. But the data about that was what year was it done? What, what kind of temperature recorder was it? Uh, how much noise was it? How much tolerance was it? was the last time it was calibrated? All these things are the metadata about the temperature readings. So name a piece of data, and there's going to be metadata about it that describes it. Okay? And that's often very, very useful, again, for search and for query and for information categorization. And it says here, it can increase the effective use of data by providing additional information that you can then work with and massage and, and use in your queries. Okay? And search is a big deal. So why do we care about digital data? Why are we thinking about digital? What's so powerful and transformative? And this comes from Blown to Bits. Digital data, this is a great kind of sentence that I kind of collapsed, collapsed from the ideas of Blown to Bits, can be copied without loss and sent instantly permanently to everyone. Crazy but wonderful and scary at the same time. All those things are affordances brought to you when things go digital. If things were physical, I have a physical record. I made a record. It's on vinyl. None of those things are true. Okay? It's not possibly permanent, although the question about permanence of digital data is an issue. Hard drives do fail. You know, who, who's going to guarantee it's a permanent? You know, I carved something in stone. That was more permanent than whatever bits I have, because that stone has lasted for, for millennia. So there's an issue about permanence for digital data. But trust me on this, that we're going to try to work this out. We'll try to find a, a solution for that. And, the, and by the way, the, the Library of Congress is deeply concerned about archiving stuff and archiving all the bits. And how do they put it? Are they putting on microfiche? It's actually fascinating. What they're, you should read up what they're doing. It's, really, it's like cutting edge stuff in terms of archivability of things. Because hard drives fail, CDs rot, all those things that you thought were ways you store your bits, massive bits, fail. What are they going to do going forward? It's a really interesting question. So without loss, that means my record, I can give it to you, and I still have my record. That's powerful. You know this from below into bits, but this is powerful stuff. Sent instantly, permanently to everyone. So it's out there forever. Everyone get it instant, and everyone gets it instantly is like a, a mind-blowing idea. It wasn't a big idea to you. You grew up with it. But the fact is, when we transform, when, when, when industries have transformed to go digital, when Kodak got its, got, you know, its, its hat handed to them because they didn't move quick enough in there, they didn't realize how powerful it is when photographs are like this. Photo, my photo of my kid can now instantly be shared with all my friends. They can keep it forever. All those things, are, and, and, and they can keep it permanently, are so powerful versus I took a picture, now I have to mail them the, the physical picture. Of, come on. This is like, that's so last week. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we're thinking about storage. We talked about storage and the difficulties on the hard drive. You store it in many different formats. Now we're talking about Library of Congress questions, how they actually do it. Okay? And you store it based on what you need of it, the size and the intended use. If I need to have really fast access, I can't put it on a tape. But if I want to have it longer storage, maybe a tape is actually more efficient and cheaper if I'm not going to have to need immediate access. Okay? So YouTube doesn't use tape because tape is too slow. They, need, they use a ton of hard drives. But hard drives don't last as long as tape, and they're way more expensive. So all that factors into how they're actually storing data okay? and based on what the usage model is. And the choice of media affects things like the cost of the data. If I, you know, media that's SSD, which is like, like a flash drive, is really fast but really expensive. So the choice I have is how fast is my access? Eric and I both do video processing. So our hard drives are all SSD drives because you need to be able to get that data back and forth out of that. Um, if you don't care about really high throughput video, you can use normal hard drives or even slower stuff. Ah, I'm using tape because I don't care. I, I can put a request in, and if it comes back a week from now, that's fine. Well, you have a robotic tape arm. And there's a library of tapes. The robot goes, zzz, 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 pulls the tape, pulls it in, spins it, gets your data. If you don't care about how fast you get it, that's a really efficient, great way to store a ton of bits, okay? a robotic tape library. 
but if you need it fast, you can't use robotic tape library. That's not going to work so much, okay? Um, this is important. Reading data and updating data have different storage requirements. Meaning, think about a CD-ROM in the days of CD-ROM. That's a way to put a read-only piece of data. Here's data. I can read from it very quickly, but I can't write it. I can't change the CD. So that's one kind of format that doesn't allow for writing. But if the requirement is I have to be able to write to it, I can't use these kind of read-only devices. Okay, so you have to have something that's not just a read-only device for that, as an example. And we mentioned before, when you have personal and private information, security and privacy of that data is really critical because you try to anonymize it or you try to store it here, but people can get to it. And so you have to really you know, build a house around it and try to lock it in and try to keep that private information private because you're, you're hold, you know, often companies are holding a lot of private stuff for people. That's important that they keep that private as well. And there are obviously trade-offs in storing and transmitting. As you're needing to store and transmit it, how you go with lossy, how you go with uh, lossless, and what format is, is, is factors into the decisions you make when you're deciding what to do in terms of storing and transmitting data. So, main reason for big for big digital data. The main reason for digital data was last slide. How about big digital data? Okay. So we mentioned this a little bit before, but when you analyze data at the size of the internet, uh, internet scale data, like massive petabytes of data, um, you can understand the world in ways that you never could before. That's a really great thing. Big data gives you, has affordances to allow to see things and nuances you couldn't before. Professor Kathy Yellick is going to talk about what happens when you look at climate simulation and you turn the resolution up. You turn the resolution down and all of a sudden you've got issues of, um, I can't see this small wave or the small hurricane. If you turn the resolution up, all of a sudden, wow, it's really revealed. It's very clear to that. So you got to worry about that. So um, Google searches can often give you lead into economic trends. So people who are in Wall Street, they present them to the company. So if all of a sudden everyone's trending about the Apple Watch, they need to know about that because they need to be buying Apple. If, that's, if everyone says, I got to have it, I got to have it, I got to have it, the social media is screaming about buying the Apple Watch, which is happening now. This is the spring of 2015. And that's the hottest thing. And everyone's, the whole world is tweeting about it. My gosh, people, I can't wait to buy it. I'm going to buy 10 for my family. Ba 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 ba. If that social media is out there, that's important to people who are making financial decisions, okay? So it's really interesting that social media is now feeding decisions by Wall Street. It's really interesting how that all feeds. You can't just be blind to what the world wants. If the world is speaking on social networks, you need to be looking at that. So now they have whole screens about popping up what are the common search terms from Google, right? How do I buy an Apple Watch? How about this? Now all of a sudden, Apple Watch comes out. A month from now is my Apple Watch is broken. How do I fix the Apple Watch? All of a sudden, the search terms are about it's not working so well. I hope it doesn't, but it, that's, that's it. All of a sudden, bam, stock is tanking because people are all saying simultaneously that. So people who are able to see and, and like leak in and peek into the queries, and Google allows you to do that with their APIs. We learned about APIs last time. You can now peek into that and get an advance notice. Well, Apple stock's probably going to drop because their watch isn't doing so well because it's having some manufacturing problems okay? or some user problems. Um, it's a really cool thing in terms of machine learning. It's really cool that, that uh, you can ask a question of data, are there animals that dance to music? And you're like, how would I find that out? Because of YouTube, you can now have that automatically calculable. In the olden days, you have to like go out there and, did anybody, anybody biologist find any animals dancing to music? Nope, never happened. Well, it doesn't happen. No, people are filming all this stuff, putting it on YouTube, and you now you can just run a query and say, search for animal, search for dancing, and all of a sudden, people are posting, hey, look, my cat dances, and there are dogs and animals that dance, and all of a sudden, I found, hey, guess what? I discovered something because of the, the world, the kind of ground, the, 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 the ground up model of people just posting stuff and, and labeling there. I can say, do animals dance? Boom, there's a video of them. Obviously, they dance, it's pretty cool stuff. How the flu progressing is a classic case of visualization. We talk about that in a moment, but you can see flu trends, and that's been overhyped. That that you know it's too predictive. It's not enough predictive. And people said, oh, this is a way that reason that big data is so great. That's been an issue. They kind of uh, got a little red faced in that they there was a paper saying that they were a little bit too over predictive. Um, that people querying for, for for flu remedies and my kid has a fever were doing it in advance of actually having the flu. So they actually if you just looked at the search terms. It doesn't actually say that if I type. How about a fever? I might have been reading about fever. I might have been hearing the song fever. Who knows what that means? But people are thinking, oh, that means you have a fever. Obviously, I tick one, Dan has a fever. No, I was just asking about it. Okay. So you can, data isn't perfect, is what to say.